Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here in Lyon. Um, so my presentation is going to focus on telling you what's the reference set of mutational signatures in human cancer. And this reference set of mutational signatures is based on something called the Peacock Initiative. And if you haven't heard about the Peacock Initiative, I envy you. Uh, the Peacock Initiative is also known as the Pan-Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes. It's an initiative that started maybe five or six years ago with the goal to perform very, very detailed characterization of about 2,700 whole genomes. And as part of the PICOC uh, initiative, uh, I'm part of the PICOC Mutational Signatures Working Group, led by Mike Stratton and Steve Rosen, who are both in the audience. And again, our goal when we started this thing is to get to the next generation of reference mutational signatures. And initially, we started with 2,700 genomes, but as part of the process, we decided, well, let's get everything, let's make it bigger. And what we did is we curated all of the available data at the time, so about, that's about 23,000 cancer uh, uh, patients. For each patient, we have a match normal. We have a normal tissue such as blood and the cancer sequenced, either at the whole exome or a whole genome level, about 5,000 whole genome sequences and about 18, 19,000 whole exome sequences. Uh, and this covers about 91 different types of human cancer, some of the most, uh, all of the common cancer types and some of the rare cancer types. Across these 24,000 ca uh, cancer cases, we were able to identify 85 million somatic mutations. Uh, and we applied two independent approaches for analysis of mutational signatures. So one is the one we developed originally at the Sanger and another one that was developed subsequently at the Broad Institute. And overall, uh, we have been able to find 49 substitution signatures, 11 doublet signatures, and 17 small insertion signatures. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to tell you about these signatures. I'm going to show them to you. I'm going to tell you the ones we understand or the ones that we have assigned a putative etiology. And then I'm going to give you three stories in three slides to tell you why you should care about mutational signatures and how we can make them more practical. So I'm going to start with the single base substitutions. And as you can see, Mike Stratton and I do share some slides, especially when it comes to introducing the different types of mutations. So single base substitutions, there are six basic single base substitutions, CT, C2A, C2G, T2A, T2C, and T2G. And usually we use these different colors to be able to show the different mutation types. But again, just six mutation classes is a bit too few. So what we have done is we have looked where they occur of the genome and we have taken the base before and the base after or the base five prime of the mutation, the base three prime of the mutation. And this allows you to distinguish these three C2T mutations because they have different preceding and succeeding bases. So you have four possible bases preceding, four possible bases succeeding. That makes 16 possible C2T mutations, and that gives you a total of 96 mutation classes. Now, 96 mutation classes is proven to be very useful because we can visualize it, we can actually look at them, and we can also have enough power to extract them. I should say we have done larger analysis with more context, uh, but for this uh, presentation, I'm just going to focus on this specific uh, set of mutational classes. And as you see, this is the way a mutational signature looks. This is the color we use. C2A we display in blue, C2G in black, C2T in red, T2A in gray, T2C in green, and T2G in this slightly washed out type of pink. And the reason we use colors is because if you look at a large set of signatures, you should be able to recognize them by the colors. So if you look at this signature here, you'll see that it has only red and that tells you it's only C2T mutations. And in fact, it has these peaks and these are C2T mutations at CPGs. And just telling C2T mutations at CPGs to a molecular biologist, one can immediately think of a process, and this is methylation followed by deamination, and whether that deamination is spontaneous or enzymatic could be the, uh, the, uh, discussed, but again, you have methylation and then deamination. And if I can show you one, I can show you all the mutation of signatures that we found as part of Peacock. Some of them were confirmed for prior studies. Quite a few are actually novel. As Mike uh, told you, we actually have been able to assign etiology so, for example, signature four, we believe, is due to tobacco smoking. And again, the reasonable question here comes is, why? What is your evidence? Why do you believe a signature has a certain etiology? And I'm going to give you 
an exemplar, how we assign etiology, and then I'm going to list all the etiologies that we have learned. So this is signature four, or SBS4. We have zoomed in into it. You can see it's pattern of mutations. You can see it has a lot of blue, which tells you there's a lot of C2A mutations. And then it has a bit of T2A and other things. If you know the literature um, of uh, benzoapirin and tobacco carcinogenesis, this is some, what is somewhat what you would expect. But even if you don't know, you can kind of work it out. So the first thing one usually does is look at the poster child, the flagship for tobacco smoking, and that will be lung cancer. And when one looks at lung cancer of smokers, and here each bar represents an individual patient, and the height of the bar tells you how many mutations there are in the patients, uh, you can see that there is a lot of blue, and that tells you there is a lot of signature 4 in these patients. And when you compare that to cancers that have never been epidemiologically linked, or the link is very uh, very low, like breast cancer to tobacco smoking, you absolutely never see signature 4. So that was our first evidence. You see signature four in the tobacco smoking. It's weak evidence, but it was an evidence that let us move forward. And then the next reasonable thing to do is say, well, if this is specific for smokers, let's compare smokers to non-smokers. And that's what we did across 12 different, type, uh, 12 different cancer types. And I'm just showing you one of them. So this is lung adenocarcinoma. One, you can see tobacco smokers. Again, this is just a subset of patients, and each bar is a single patient. And you can see here there is a lot of blue. There is a lot of signature four mutations. And you can compare that to lifelong non-smokers. And you can see they have much fewer mutations in their genomes, and there is much less blue. One can do the proper statistical testing with the proper multiple hypothesis testing correction. You see that there is about seven or eight-fold enrichment of signature four, which is very highly statistically significant with a Q value of 10 to the minus 40, 10 to the minus 50. So that was our second evidence, enrichment of, of the signature in smokers compared in non-smokers. And again, we see that in all tissues directly exposed to tobacco smoking. And the, sec and the third and probably most convincing evidence is, well, if you believe something is caused by a specific agent, the reasonable thing to do is to take that carcinogen, expose cells or expose mouse models, sequence it, and to see whether one is able to reproduce that mutational pattern. So you see here, and that's exactly what was done uh, by uh, Dave Phillips' uh, lab in King's College with benzoapirin. Uh, what you see here is signature 4 extracted in, from human cancers, and what you see be, below is the signature of benzoapirin exposure in vitro in mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And again, if you look at the, if you just visually look at them, they look very, very similar. You can quantify it, you can say that they have 95, 96% similarity, but again, that gives us confidence that what we, confidence to assign an etiology. So the type of evidence that we use to assign an etiology for a mutation or signature? Well, in the case of tobacco smoking, it's found only in cancer types epidemiologically known to be caused by smoking. It's highly enriched in tobacco smokers compared to non-smokers. There is also a dose response. The more you smoke, the more mutations you get. I didn't show you that. And also the pattern of signature for matches in vivo experimental results in which cells are exposed to tobacco carcinogens. And this has been confirmed over a number of in vitro models now. So this is the type of evidence we like to have. We like to have some epidemiology, some associative dose-response relationship, and again, some experimental results and being able to say this signature is caused by smoking. Now, I cannot tell you how we've done that for every single one of these signatures, but I'm going to just enumerate them. I'm going to list what we have found. And then, as I said, I'll tell you three recent stories. Signatures one and five, we believe these are clock-like mutational processes. These are processes that accumulate with age. The older you get, the more mutations you get from these, these signatures. Signature four is due to tobacco smoking. I showed you the evidence we've used to, uh, uh, to uh, assign this etiology. However, if you ask, does tobacco chewing have the same signature? Well, it doesn't. It has a slightly different signature for one reason or another, and that's signature 29. UV light has a number of mutational signatures with some in interesting findings there, potentially linked to the places around the world, potentially linked to germline variants in people. Aflatoxin, um, this mold growing on corn, has uh, its own signature and causes all kinds of nasty cancers, so signature 24. 
AA, aristolochic acid. There is, you hear a lot by, from, uh, about that from Steve Frozen. This beautiful plant has, or several of these beautiful plants have this very, very potent uh, mutagen, one of the most potent mutagens in human cancer. And again, that causes all kinds of cancers around the world. Temozolomites, so patients who were, uh, had primary cancers, they were treated, they either had a recurrence or they had a secondary cancer, well, we can see the chemotherapy. And temozolomide has a signature 11 in most cases. Platinum therapy, there is at least two signatures of platinum therapy, signatures uh, 31 and signatures 35. Azotioprine, I'll tell you more about azotioprine, it's immunosuppressant, it has its own mutational signature, that's signature 32. Hell alkanes, signature 42. And then one can start looking at things that fail in DNA, such as defective DNA repair. Mismatch repair has many, many signatures, which are caused by different mechanisms. Some of them we understand, some of them we do not. In contrast, failure of homologous recombination, such as mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2, due to mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, has a single signature. Defective base excision repair, if you have a MUT-YH mutations, you get signature 36. If you get NTH1 mutations, you get signature 30. Defective polymerase epsilon, signatures 10A and 10B. Putatively assigned the signature 9 to the infidelity of polymerase ethyl activity. AID uh, is signature 84. And then Apobex, the most prevalent mutagens in human cancer, at least in adulthood human cancer. They have two signatures, uh, signature 2 and signature 13. In addition to the ones that we have assigned etiology or at least proposed an etiology, 18 of the 49 signatures, we have no idea what's causing them. There's some hypothesis, but we have not been able to assign a conclusive etiology. I should say we have 18 additional single point mutation signatures, which are either known artifacts, eight of them, or possible artifacts. So things that we are unsure whether they're caused uh, whether they're not just generated by the different experimental techniques or by informatics approaches. And essentially, every large sequencing center has its own artifact. So, very, so these were the single point mutational signatures. Very briefly, I'll tell you what we have been doing to the indo mutational signatures. This was something completely new then as part of the Peacock Initiative. And one of the problems for indo signatures is that one cannot classify them as simple as single point mutation signatures. Um, I'm not going to go to the details of this classification, uh, but just briefly, um, we separated indels at one base pair deletions and one base pair insertions. We then look at them at longer indels at repetitive elements, as well as longer indels at microhomologies. There is a lot of um, thought and a lot of um, biological reasoning behind this classification, but again, I think this is beyond the, talk, beyond the scope of this talk. But when we looked across these cancer genomes, when we looked across these 23,000 cancer genomes, or at least the ones for which we had Indo information, we were able to find 17 Indo signatures. And from about half of them, we were able to, again, assign etiology. We had clock-like processes assigned for at least two of the Indo signatures. But we also show that if there is a defective mismatch repair, these signatures explode. They generate many, many mutations. There was an Indo signature of tobacco smoking, which was extremely surprising. Um, if one has asked a few years back, does tobacco smoking cause insertions and deletions? Probably the answer would have been no. But what you can see is a very, very clear, very strong signature of Indos in tobacco smoking, and similarly very strong and clear signatures from UV light in cancers of the skin, such as melanoma. Uh, uh, failure of homologous recombination had its own clean signature of uh, indels at microhomologies, and there is another uh, indel signature putatively assigned to radiation exposure, again, generating indels at microhomologies. And again, for the 10 out of the 17 signatures, we had no idea what causes them. And again, just searching to the next set of signatures, the double base substitution, so this is just another type to classify things. These are mutations that co-occur. So instead of having a single base mutation, you have a double base mutation, so you have CC mutating to TT adjacent to each other in a single event. And we were able to classify in 70, uh, 73 possible double base, uh, possible mutations for double, base, uh, double bases. And you can see one of the signature 
And again, it's exclusively, almost exclusively CC to TT. And that's exactly what one would expect from UV light exposure. That's exactly what one would expect to see in cancers of the skin such as melanoma. And indeed, that's what we were able to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to assign as etiology. Interestingly, we were able, looking at a cell aldehyde, and uh, we would propose the DBS2. Its etiology is probably linked to a cell aldehyde, which we do not have at this moment experimental validation, but we have some cor uh, correlative studies and associative studies. Platinum therapy, again, it generated its own double base substitutions. Defective polymerase epsilon had its own double base substitutions. Defective mismatch repair had its own uh, two signatures. And we believe the Apobec signatures, in addition to single point mutations, generate these double point mutations. And for four out of the 11 double base substitution signatures, we were not able to assign etiologies. So this was my high level overview of the different mutational signatures over about 25,000 cancer genomes. But I want to tell you three stories. Each story is a single slide. And these are three stories that were published within the last year, year and a half. So the first thing I'm going to uh, uh, tell you how one can use mutational signatures for looking and discovering potentially novel, novel germline predisposition syndromes. And I'm going to make that point showing you what we've done and how others have taken that work and actually discovered this predisposition uh, uh, syndrome. So in 2013, we published the first comprehensive map of mutational signatures. There were 21 signatures. And just two years later, we actually uh, 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 released the first version of the COSMIC website. We found additional nine mutational signatures, and one of these nine mutational signatures was signature 30. And that signature 30 was found in three or four samples, and it had unknown etiology at the time. We didn't know what it was. We were sure it was real. We reported it. Uh, two years later, Hans Clever's group in the Netherlands, in one of their CRISPR screens, they were able to reproduce it when they... Um, introduced a defective NTH01 uh, base excision repair gene. They were able to actually generate signature 30. They were able to assign an etiology. And just this year, in 2019, just looking uh, through different families with tumors, signature 30 was found in 29 tumors from seven, organ, uh, seven organs in 17 different families. Each one of them was harboring a specific germline uh, deficiency, again, all in NTH1, NTH01. And one of the main selling points of this recent cancer cell paper was the usability of mutational signatures to actually find syndromes, which could be rare or which could be multi-tissue syndromes, just by looking at the patterns of mutations, just by looking at mutational signatures as phenotypes. So this was my first story. My second story is about azotiaprine. Uh, which was published in 2018 in Nature Communications. And again, this is the beautiful picture of azotiaprine. And I always find it very interesting when you read about azotiaprine, you go to the WHO website and it says, this is one of the safest, most effective, most used uh, immunosuppressant drugs. Every hospital should have it. And then you go to IARC's website and says, this is a non-carcinogen. It causes cancer. The mechanisms of that have been questioned, from what I can say, mostly from the producers of azotiaprine. Uh, the, the actual, uh, they have a number of papers questioning IARC classification as group one. So in that paper, we took azotiaprine and we exposed mild embryomic fibroblasts, and this is the mutation of signatures that we got, signature 32. And this is the signature 32 that we got from patients that have had transplant surgery that have taken azotiaprine. And each one of these patients had high levels of signature 32. And not only did they have high levels of signature 32, but the more immunotherapy, immunosuppression that they had, the more mutations they had from that drug. And only they, not only did they have a dose response effect, but when we looked at the driver mutations, we were able to say, well, the majority of driver mutations are generated by the actual immunosuppressant drug. So this is the way we were able to attribute azotiaprine to signature 32 and we were able to find it in patients that had, immuno, uh, 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 that had transplant surgery. And my last story is in a is in, from a Nature paper in 2018 in a collaboration with the St. Jude team looking into UV light. When we were looking at UV light, one would think about skin cancers. 
And all of a sudden, in their B cell ALLs, we started seeing the signatures of ultraviolet light. And this is the way signature 7A looks. This is one of the signatures of UV light. And this is the way their samples, all the samples that they had, or individual samples, looked like. So very, very similar pattern. Everything we knew about UV light, strand bias, dinucleotide, indels, was present in their samples. And we were very puzzled at that time. How can that, be, uh, how can that happen? And as this paper was being reviewed, uh, actually an epidemiological study came out from a French group saying that the only known risk factor for B cell ALL, they looked at a number of cancer types, is exposure to ultraviolet light. So we also got our epidemiological, uh, epidemiological confirmation. Interestingly enough, the St. Jude team and subsequently uh, the DKFZ now have been able to confirm that in multiple cohorts. It happens only in Caucasian children, and as far as I know, it's the only environmental risk uh, for um, environmental risk in childhood ALL. Just looking in general at UV light, we see it obviously in cancers of the skin, uh, the, uh, the skin but again, and lip cancers, which again is things that are exposed to sunlight, but remarkably, we saw it in childhood cancers, and again, remarkably, we see it at about 20% in, of sarcomas. And as far as people can tell, all of them are really sarcomas. They are not, they are not misannotated uh, or misunderstood melanomas. In contrast, we see it also in squamous cell lung carcinoma and some of the lung cancers, and almost in every single case, this has been melanoma metastasis. So this was my third story that again, came out last year. And last, very, very briefly, because I am out of time, very much, uh, I wanted to tell you all of these signatures, all of what we have done has been released on the COSMIC website. We have provided a lot of information about these signatures, their plots, their numerical data, but also their presence in human cancer and a very, very detailed and curated information uh, about what we know, their etiology, their mutation classes, and comments of what we have observed and what we have learned. And in summary, I hope I was able to show you that there are many, many signatures. Uh, there are substitution signatures, there are indo signatures, there are double-based substitution signatures. Some of them we understand, some of them we don't. But through mutographs and through, as you hear, some of other initiatives that are being conducted, we hope to be able to understand most of them and we hope to be able to explain most of the incidence of human cancer around the world. Very briefly, collaborators, Mike Stratton and Steve Frozen, who are leading the PCOC uh, working group for mutational signatures, Gadi Getz, Jago Kim, who did a lot of the work at the Broad, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you.